Well, hello. There's a little bit of unintentional irony in what I just did about one minute before I turned on this, this camera. Went outside to turn on my drip tape to water my garden. So we'll come back to that. Because <laughs> uh, that's going to fit into this kind of nicely. So a few years ago, or maybe it was last year, I don't know. I reviewed this book, uh, Cadillac Desert by uh, Mark Reisner. And uh, it was all about the, as it says in the subtitle, the American West and its disappearing water. So, uh, <laughs> let's just take a brief, this is not going to be a garden video, but let's just take a brief field trip and go look at the garden. So we're just going to take a quick look at a water saving watering technique. Not going to be compelling video, but here it is. So first of all, we have a flow restrictor to slow down the water. Also have a leak I need to fix. But what it does is it runs tape. So let's go to a clearer bed. Uh, one of the beds where nothing came up. <laughs> so you can see it just really slowly, slowly, slowly drips out the water. Uh, I usually run this for about three hours because it takes that long. But what it means is the water doesn't evaporate as much and because it's so slow, it has time to soak into the soil. If I watered this with a sprinkler, a lot of water would just sit on top. It takes a while just to get the soil so it's gonna start letting the water soak in. So uh, this drip tape system has worked really well. I've only been running this, what, 15 or 20 minutes, so it's got quite a long ways to, oh, a weed. Uh, it's got quite a long time to run yet, but anyway, just a neat system. And it really, I use less water and uh, my garden grows better. So nice desert system. All right, so you saw that the drip tape, the whole idea is to conserve water. We want the water going into the plants, not into the air, or just being wasted and running off down the street or whatever. So uh, that was, it was a system developed for desert farming, uh, where you have to be careful of water. Now, you can be careful of water. The water's not there. Then what do you do? So I'm going to talk today about a book by Paolo Bacigalupi called The Water Knife. Uh, tangential note, because I seem to be doing a lot of those in my videos today. Uh, last thing I'm writing in this notebook. I filled another notebook. Um, so anyway, Paolo Bacigalupi's book The Water Knife was published in 2015. And I love a book that sticks with me. In fact, uh, kind of contemporaneous with this, I'm going to be doing a series of driving videos just kind of generally about books. And that's one of the things we're going to bring up. So uh, I've reviewed a few books here that are just junk food. Um, you know, once you read them, you know, they're entertaining, then you forget them. Uh, I couldn't tell you much about them a week later. Other books are relationship. The Water Knife and I and now Cadillac Desert, thanks to the water knife, <laughs> have a relationship. Uh, so <clears throat> Cadillac Desert was all about water in the West. It was a, you know, it's chilling to look at the fragile infrastructure that maintains water and energy in major cities like Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Phoenix. Uh, these cities depend on water, sometimes from hundreds of miles away. The infrastructure that brings it to them is crazy and fragile and has been fought over. Uh, read Cadillac Desert if you want to hear about that. But anyway, uh, you have dams on the Colorado River that are generating hydroelectric power. And California's, yeah, California, people always think of Hollywood. California is also one of the major agricultural states in the United States. Uh, its agriculture industry depends on water from far, far away. Uh, so over the past few years, the southwest of the United States has been in a major drought. And the water level in the Colorado River, which is a major source of moisture for that area, has dropped. Uh, you can see 
the bathtub rings like left behind the dams on this river, like Lake Mead. Um, you now bathtub rings meaning literally the water used to be here and now it's down here, but you know it was up there so long that it left a ring on the rocks. Las Vegas right now is patting itself on the back because it constructed a new intake pipe to Lake Mead. Uh, because its existing intake pipe is now above the water level in Lake Mead. They saw it coming, so they constructed a new intake pipe much lower. In fact, they claim that this new intake pipe is actually going to uh, last even when the water is no longer able to flow. Which is scary as hell. Um... So one of my links below is uh, to a video about a boat tour around Lake Mead. It's made by a gentleman who is a full-time RVer. He lives in his RV year-round. Um, I actually found the channel the first time because he stayed overnight in my town. But anyway, he, he, he documented a lot of places I know. Uh, I subscribed when he started exploring the desert southwest. Remember, relationship. Cadillac Desert, the water knife. I have a relationship now. Um, I think he stayed in that area this summer because of gas prices, but that's another topic. Um, and the disaster that I'm about to talk about might be here now. So what I'm doing is I'm prefacing this book that led me in this direction. Paolo Bacigalupi's The Water Knife. Um... In the book, he actually refers quite a number of times to Cadillac Desert. So I'm going to guess Paolo Bacigalupi has a relationship with Cadillac Desert also. Uh, it's set in the near future in a time when the worst nightmares of Cadillac Desert have come true. Uh, and I think, I, and I think I'm pretty safe in saying this, that the setting is the early days of his dystopian future he, he, he portrays in a lot of his other novels, like Shipbreaker, The Wind-Up Girl... Uh, and more. Now, in this novel, there is a U.S. government. It's weak, but it's still functional. Uh, and the story is told through the eyes of three people. You have Lucy Monroe, who's a journalist who moved to Phoenix to document the story of a dying place and fell in love with the people in place. Remember, it's science fiction, so if you're from Phoenix, don't get angry at me for saying it's a dying place. This is <laughs> science fiction. Uh, we have Maria Villarosa, who's a Texas migrant and who is absolutely desperate to escape north. And then we have Angel Velasquez, uh, the water knife, who is an a agent for the uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority. And he will do anything, including kill or blow things up in order to obtain water for Las Vegas. So when word comes of water near Phoenix... All three of them end up on a collision course in Phoenix. Now, like I said, U.S. government is still somewhat functional, so uh, water rights have to be held legally. Uh, they might use underhanded means to obtain those rights, but it has to have at least a veneer of legality. And that's part of what uh, Angel Velasquez's uh, talent is. Uh, so the Phoenix in this novel is a nightmare world of water smuggling, stripped and abandoned suburbs, yeah, you think suburbs are going to survive when we can't get water? Um, organized crime, corrupt government. And uh, the violence of this book, because there is some, there's a lot. Uh, the violence of this book is hard to read. I, uh, when I talk about things I don't like in books, gratuitous violence is one of them. Uh, but I think in this book it was needed because it illustrates the cruel world that these characters inhabit. And nobody in this book emerges unscathed. Uh, Bachi Galupi's writing always immerses you, all your senses in the world. You get your sound, your sight, your taste, your touch, and your smell. You know, you can experience the grid of the desert. You can smell all the sweaty people. You're sticky because you can't waste water on a shower. Uh, so if you've looked at green lawns and huge houses in the desert southwest and wondered... How? Um, this book shows their future. Uh, when I visited the desert southwest, I was, which would have been about 2003 or four, I was amused by the round fields. Round because the 
irrigation system going around like this to water them. Uh, now I recognize the huge threat that they represent. Um, so the book gets into things like arcologies, which are self-contained worlds inside large buildings that heavily recycle their water and provide a welcome escape for the fortunate, meaning wealthy, few. Uh, and it's worth noting that in the present day, Las Vegas recycles its water. Its water. In fact, uh, I said I'm going to link to the video about the RVer on a boat tour in Lake Mead. I'm going to link to another of his videos where he shows that recycled wa wastewater being returned to Lake Mead. And as a kicker at the end of the video, he goes up the hill to this restaurant and finds a strip of grass with a dead tree in it getting watered with a sprinkler. Oh, right there on the shores of the drying up Lake Mead. And, and, and that thing is chilling if you watch his video because he, he goes past, they've got signs up on these old boat launches about, oh, in 2003, the water level was here. And, uh, you know, he gets to th 2021 and you're like, well, how much worse can it get? Ooh. And he's dropping forever till he gets to the present day water level. So very scary. But anyway, um, California isn't quite to the place Las Vegas is, but they are investigating doing the same. Uh, and such a system isn't perfect because there's still going to be a lot of water loss. But necessary. Part of the future. I mean, if you're going to live there, you got to figure out how to get multiple uses out of that water. Uh, one message that comes out of this book is that Hard times require hard people. Uh, in hard times, we might actually have to set your moral scruples aside in order to survive or take care of those you love. Uh, the concept of, or, of objective morality might be comforting, but kind of falls apart in the face of reality. We don't steal. What if you're starving? <laughs> you're going to steal. Starve to death or steal food. What if it's your kid who's starving? Sorry, kid. It's wrong to steal. Um, and you're in a system now in this book that there's no hope for the kid unless you steal for him. Um, you know, you, you may not want to offer your body for sex. What if you're desperate? Happens in this book. You know, I'm pointing this out because at the climax of the story, one of the truly selfless and good characters is murdered to protect millions of people. And the mur this murder itself condemns millions of other people to a long, slow death. And it's that part's kind of hard to read. You know, you, the whole time, whole book through, you're kind of thinking, well, there's going to be a happy ending. And, you know, it's a satisfying ending, but it's gray. Um, you know, and it's gray because you realize that the characters involved aren't wrong. They're trying to survive, and they're trying to help their own people to survive. Um, I've always said you don't know what you'll do in a situation until you're in that situation. I know we all talk about what we'd like to think we'd do. But what are you really going to do? And fortunately, most of us never get the chance to find out what we would really do. So we can sit back in our comfortable air-conditioned homes with plenty of water that we can put on a garden, even though there's a grocery store over there, because we're that comfortable. And we can just think about it and never find out. So the book takes us to people who are in that desperate situation. One of the values of fiction is to put us in the mind and place of other people and develop some empathy. May not agree, understand <laughs> um, so these people are finding out who they really are the good character proves to be as dedicated and noble as we were led to believe through the whole book they're also willing to commit personal violence sorry there's all kinds of stuff going on outside my window <laughs> uh, but uh, they're also willing to commit personal violence to protect the good uh, this is the kind of self-sacrifice our heroes you know, in other fiction and in real life, 
perform to protect the good. Turns out to be for nothing. So definitely not an easy read. It's not one of those books you just sit down as a Saturday cozy book. Um, it takes you to some hard places, but it has really stuck with me. I have been exploring and reading about the water situation in the desert southwest ever since. Um, I bought Cadillac Desert right after I finished this book. Uh, in a few years which will be soon. My house is paid off and I've replaced my elderly car, which will be uh, 25 years old then. I'd like to go back and explore the desert southwest. I think it is a beautiful, beautiful part of the country. Uh, Monument Valley is one of the most scenic places I've ever seen. I want to go back to some of those canyons I saw. Uh, I want to go back just to the wide open desert. I want to go back to Bisbee, Arizona. I want to go back... Uh, Anyway, um, I want to go back. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Uh, just maybe not with a 22-year-old car. Uh, I wish back then I'd had a dash cam, because that would have been some amazing footage to save. Um, but anyway, uh, learning about the water situation, which I kind of knew about intellectually before, definitely gave me a new, deeper perspective on the desert southwest. Um, definitely a deeper appreciation for uh, what that world is. Um, science fiction can be a pretty amazing lens on things. Uh, Bachi Galupi projected what in 2015 were contemporary trends into the future. And it scares me to think we might be seeing his dystopic future playing out in the present day. And, uh, you know, with climate change and... I, we, I just don't know. And uh, pity the poor people who are further down river on the Colorado River. The small towns, the poorer people, <laughs> Mexico, which gets like a trickle of the river. You know, uh, we got a lot of problems there. Uh, and uh, a whole world that's been built that is dependent on this water that's not even local. And people move there constantly. These are growing places. Man, is that scary. A scary thought. Um, I That's not something I ever would have thought about when I was younger. But... Uh, you know, where I'm at, thanks to our low population, we are sustainable with our water use. Plus, farmers here don't irrigate. Uh, but, man, if it gets bad down there, they're going to be coming to places like this. Because what do you do without water? And the other big one is the energy. If there's not enough water to run those dams, those hydroelectric power dams... That is a tremendous amount of electrical power that's just gone. Then what? How do you live in the hot desert southwest without electrical power? To run air conditioners. And, you know, the water. Uh, you just can't. So, uh, yeah, we're headed into some scary times down there. So, uh, you know, I hope the water comes. I hope I hope we get solutions. But, uh, you know, books like this help you think about it. And uh, even when you don't want to think about it. So, anyway, I want to thank you for watching. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.